Hey, hello everyone. This is criminal profiler Pat Brown, and I don't think I can say my name correctly today. <laughs> Pat Brown. Hmm. Good start to the show. Um, you know, once I did a, a show, I was doing MSNBC, and um, the the uh, the host of the show she came back to me and she said, "Well, thank you very much, Crap Brown." And um, at which point I said, "Thank you." And then we went to a break. And when we had to come back, I was like laughing so hard because she called me Crap Brown. Uh, <laughs> obviously, criminal profiler. She had kind of crushed those together. And uh, I think I was biting my teeth and I was doing everything, like, everything to stop from laughing. Uh, I had to come back and we had to do a second segment. It was really hard, but it was so funny. I, I put that show up on my uh, YouTube page and somebody said, well, that host told it right. That is crap brown. <laughs> People are so sweet. Anyway, hi, I'm criminal profiler Pat Brown, and I'm going to speak clearly now. Uh, I want to do this show today. I've been requested over and over on both of these cases. Why? because they're unsolved in the sense that, quite frankly, we don't know that much about either one of these cases. Uh, this is Ray Gricar, um, and this is a Jonathan Luna, and they're both attorneys, and they both ended up somewhere in Pennsylvania. Uh, he lived in Pennsylvania. He lived in Maryland. They both ended up taking a drive and so ended up somewhere in Pennsylvania. He went missing his car was there, but he was not. His car was there, and he was next to it uh, with 36 stab wounds and uh, lying in a creek um, dead. Okay, so what the heck? And both of these cases are unsolved, all right? And why is that? This His case was originally, uh, Ray Gricar's case was originally sort of labeled a suicide, but they never found his body. So they thought maybe it was a walk away. Some people believe he was murdered and his body was put someplace so that it wouldn't be found. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the fact that there, these two guys are both involved in cases that are, um, that could have people, shall we say, might have issues with these two guys because they were prosecutors. Um, Jonathan Luna, um, his his case, his body was found with 36 stab wounds. This is true. But it was a labeled a suicide, which many people said, are you kidding me? How could this be a suicide? And then it was sort of relabeled a homicide. But it's kind. there's kind of an, a split between two agencies who are doing the labeling, one saying it's suicide, one saying it's homicide. And obviously, he didn't go missing. So we do know he was... He's dead. We do not know if Ray Gricar is dead or not because his body has never been found. So what I want to do with these two cases is look at um, what's in common with these two cases. And there's so much in common. What happened before they went missing? They're, both of them had some concerning behaviors prior to them, I'll say, I won't say going missing, before they took their ride, okay, before they got in their vehicles and drove away, there were some concerning things happening. They were also involved in cases that could theoretically uh, have people not be happy with them. Um, and uh, also the other thing that's very similar in both of these cases is that they're both open cases. Uh, there's no police report on this that I can find on, on Greg Gricar. Obviously, obviously, there's no autopsy because his body was never found. But there's a lot of information I just simply don't know. And similarly here, his body was found, but the autopsy report has never been released, nor any of the, of the police reports. Some believe that that's because there's some really, you know, nefarious stuff going on with the FBI and other other whatever agencies he might have dealt with or with the Baltimore um, whole legal system there, the uh, criminal justice system or with whatever. So it's never been released. Um, another thing that's kind of interesting in both of these cases is that neither, the, neither men, man, man, uh, the, of these men have families who have pushed heavily 
to have these cases, quote, solved. In other words, I haven't seen uh, Grikar's daughter, uh, his girlfriend, his ex-wives push, 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 like we see often in the media for his case to be solved. Likewise with Luna, I can't even find a picture of his wife. He has two, his wife he had a wife and um, two sons, and I don't see a lot of push. Like he was brutally murdered. Why is nobody solving the case of my murdered husband? Seems to be non-existent. So odd things in these two cases. And I'm going to go over the different oddities and tell, uh, kind of look at what that means to us if we're going to analyze. If you are a criminal profiler, from outside the case, how would you even look at these cases? Um, how will I look at these cases with a good, uh, shall we say limited information, limited. Okay, so I wanna say hello to people in the chat room. Oh, okay, so hello everybody here. Um, by the way, if you'd like to be in the chat room, let me just uh, do, do the needful as is said in India and not in the US, but in India, we say do the needful. I say we because I've been in, in, in India a lot, although I'm not Indian at all. All right. <laughs> you can join Patreon. It's five bucks a month. That'll, that gets you into all the live shows. So you can be in the chat room. Um, there's eight shows a month in the chat room. Um, also, I have a, a weekly chat um, online so that if you want to ask me questions specifically, then you have a, a better conduit to, to talk to me or to ask for uh, certain cases you would like to be uh analyzed so it's kind of a small community um which is lovely and i i enjoy having everyone in that community also in the chat room so that i have somebody to talk to when i'm doing these shows as opposed to just a camera and i don't like just talking to a camera so it's nice to know people are out there so please do join it also supports the channel even if you can't make every one of the shows you know the five bucks a month does help support the channel oh otherwise you can just subscribe to the channel everything i do is Everything I do is 100% available, even if you don't subscribe, even if you don't join Patreon. I don't hide anything and have special things for people. No, everything is available. So every one of my videos is available so you can learn from it. And that's my point. So do subscribe to support the channel. Click the little bell so you get notifications. Helps out. You can also buy books. You can click the little dollar sign and donate. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's enough of that. Let me go to the chat room. And this is going to be one of the reasons I'm really psyched about the chat room in this particular case is because we have so little information. I am curious to see what people are going to think about these two cases with the limited information that we have. So this is a, I want to say again, this is an educational channel. It's a learning channel. I'm not here for gossip. We're not here to solve cases. None of that stuff. We're here to understand things and how things work. So welcome everybody in the chat room. I'm just going to say a quick hello because it is a busy chat room. And I want to see what some of your comments are. Annie Haley's here. I'm glad you're back, Annie. Um, Deanie's going <laughs> to take her son oh, on the Queen Mary. Well, there's two choices. Queen Mary, Pat Brown. So, <laughs> but and Deanie has a good question. And I'm going to address some of these questions as we go along. She says, I have a question in regards to Jonathan Luna. If he can cheat on his wife, and there's going to be information later on. This is what I talk about when there's concerning information prior to their disappearances or death. Um, that might help us understand what happened. Um, he was on some shall we say, his name appeared on websites. That's all I really get. His name appeared on websites looking for ladies. That did not look like his wife. <laughs> now, I don't even know if this is true. And this is, you have to understand this. This is what's on the internet. I don't know, because it's not coming from police reports, I have no clue whether it's accurate. It is stated someone with using his name, which I would say if you are a, an important man in the criminal justice system, why the heck would you use your own name? So either he was being very careless or it isn't him. So I don't know. Uh, and also he was accused of stealing money. Uh, and that is actually a, a true accusation in the sense that he was working on a case and a whole bunch of money disappeared that he was responsible for. And that is concerning. So the question at Dini is reasonable as if we're analyzing a case. If he is a cheater, if he is, and we do not know this is true, then why wouldn't he steal money? 
And that's a good question. Uh, I, I point that out quite often when we're talking about ethics and morality. When a person is willing to do A, which is underhanded and and um, not proper behavior, and includes lying to somebody, then oftentimes B is not so far away. And that is important to understand. Uh, because if you do one, then you might do the other. Now, there are people out there who say, oh, that has nothing to do with it. There are men who have two wives and have never stolen a penny. True. But they already have a, no problem with doing something that is underhanded and looking somebody in the eye and saying, I'm not cheating on you. And if they can do that, what else can they do? So it's perfectly reasonable to ask that question, I would say. So... I think it's a good question. Martin is here. Hi, Martin. Fairy Princess is here. Fairy Princess says, I don't think it was suicide. And she's talking about Luna, who was stabbed 36 times. Now, Ray Grikar, his body is not found. And I'm going to explain this all in a minute. Um, there are two different cases. Um, his body hasn't been found, so we don't know what happened. It could have been murder. It could have been suicide. It could have been he walked away. He is stabbed 36 times. We know he didn't walk away because <laughs> he can't walk away with 36 stab wounds in, the, in a crowded artery. You know, so it's either suicide or homicide. So that's true. So she's saying it's, she's leaning toward homicide. Perfectly reasonable. All right. Uh, Carrie is here. Um, let's see who is. Linda is here from Big Bear Lake, California. Yes. I wish I was there. I like Big Bear Lake. Okay. Um, Allison is here. Um well, you're on a time. That's fabulous. And you're, you're here at the show. Um, I must have already said about Fairy Princess. Uh, let's see. Texas Redhead is here. Emily is here. Uh, uh, Kay Klein is here. Looking forward to this. I lived right in the middle of the location of these two cases in Pennsylvania at the time they occurred. Can't wait to hear what Pat has to say. And I'm in the area, too. I'm in Bowie, Maryland. I have a, I'm 20 minutes from Baltimore. Um, so I know Baltimore and what's going on up there. So I'm more connected to this than I am to Pennsylvania because that's across the state line, but close enough, I would say. Um, and let's see. Martin says we have a fine audience. Oh, that's so good. Vera's here. Lisa S. is here. Um, Emily is here. Uh, <laughs> first thing we do, let's kill all the lawyers. Yeah, Shakespeare. Shakespeare did have that opinion. Um, he did. Um, uh, Maria's here. Uh, let's see who else here. GMFR is here and uh, finish my yard work. Okay, well, good for you. Woo. Um, well, this is interesting. Uh, Marie says, I'm excited to hear about the cases. I don't think I've ever heard of them before. Uh, so you're going to be fresh eyes. Yes, and that's cool because there's a lot of people who have a lot of opinions on these two cases. Um, and Fairy Princess says, I think victim number two made himself disappear. That would be this, this guy because obviously he didn't disappear. His body was found. All right. Let's go to Ray Grickar. I'm going to start with him. Okay, so Ray Grickar, let me tell you about him. All right. He's been missing since April 15, 2005. He's an American lawyer who served as the district attorney of Center County, Pennsylvania. From 1985 to 2005, you see, he, he was uh, 20 years uh, as a district, district attorney. Um, so, and he was reelected over and over again. Very, very well liked. Nobody had any issues with him at all. Okay. Um, extremely good at his job. Um, people did, they liked him. They liked him. Um, he was born in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, this is important. So he moved to Pennsylvania around 1980 uh, he was assistant district attorney, and then he was elected district attorney of Center County in 1985. He was reelected four times before announcing that he would not run for reelection in the 2005 campaign. Why not? Many people ask, why not? Before he'd been reelected four times, why not five times? Uh, now, mind you, his age at the time was, um, he was 59. Retirement age. He was like, a, basically, he's going to finish out the last, you know, uh, last bit of his his uh, time, and he was just not going to run again. So he was theoretically retiring, and many people say he was happy about retiring. He was going to have the freedom he didn't have working as much as he did being a district attorney. Um, 
and he had lots of ideas about traveling and he, he, he seemed to be happy about the concept of retiring, but he was retiring. Okay. Keep that in mind. All right. Now, as far as his personal life, this is also sort of important because we're going to talk about, well, we have to talk about personal lives and in the cases where somebody is going to either commit suicide, run off, if they get murdered, not so important, but if the other two are involved, then you have to ask. Our personal lives are the most important things in our life. Well, some people think business life is more important, but you know, family, whether we're having good relationships, whether we're happy, whether we wake up in the morning next to somebody we like or somebody we don't like, <laughs> you know, these are important things. Um, Greek car, met Barbara Gray. Oh, by the way, it is a Wikipedia I'm using. I have many different... Um, Piece, uh, sites of information. And people always ask, why do I go to Wikipedia? It's because the other sites have a lot of extra information. And I'm trying to narrow it down to just the basics so we can work from there. Not always, Wikipedia is not always accurate. I'm not so thrilled about my Wikipedia page, but okay. <laughs> it's still useful. Uh, Greg Carr met Barbara Gray during his undergraduate study at UD. Uh, he, she moved to Cleveland with him after graduation. They married in 1969. They adopted a baby girl, Lara, in 1978. That's the only child he has is the one daughter. Ray and Barbara uh, Greg Carr divorced in 1991. We have no information about why they divorced. Not that it's any of our business particularly, but when a person goes missing or commits suicide or is murdered, the question is, what was going on in his personal life? Who was he from point from point A to point B to point C to point D? Who was this person? Um, so he married again in 1996, but divorced in, in 2001. So that was his second wife. He divorced. They had no children. In 2002 or 2003, Greek car moved in with his girlfriend, Patty Fornicola, an employee of the Center County District Attorney's Office. So anyway, little office romance. He, he moved in with Patty. He did not marry her. Okay. He was living with Fornicola in her childhood home in Belafonte at the time of his disappearance. So he moved into her house, uh, which was a little distance, not far, but where from where he was working, but close by. She had a childhood home she lived in. And interesting enough, he paid off the, um, what was left on the mortgage, which is interesting. Um, and I cannot, here is where we have one of the biggest problems in both these cases. Information is so incredibly limited. I don't know why, but I cannot find things. I wanted to know how much he paid off. And I wanted to know when he paid it off. I mean, this is not his wife. This is a girlfriend. Um, and yet he paid off her mortgage. I don't know too many guys who will do that. So I want to know, did he pay off her mortgage right before he disappeared? Or did he pay off her mortgage early, you know, early on. Let's see. They were together. Let's see. He moved in in 2002 or 2003. And when did he go missing? Two years later, he goes missing. So I I don't know how much was left of the mortgage. Um, that's nice of him. <laughs> Move into my house. Um, no. Uh, was it a tiny amount? And he said, look, I will pay for this. He might have said something like this. Um, Hey, I would have to pay this in, in, in rent money for the next two years. So I'm just going to pay off your mortgage. It's only, let's say, thought rent was going to be fifteen hundred a month, and you thought, okay, if I if I, if I give her twenty thousand dollars, it's it's the same thing as if I paid rent for a year. Maybe he did that. Maybe it's not a big deal, but we don't know, and that's one of the problems with this case. Why did he pay it off? Did he want to take care of her after he was no longer here, or was it just a normal? you know, something he did because he planned to be with her for a couple of years at least, you know, and he thought, what the heck, I'm not paying rent. I'll just pay off your mortgage. I don't know. We can't find that out. So anyway, but he was living with uh, Patty uh, at the time. And um, here's a very interesting point about Greek car. His older brother, Roy Greek car, he's Ray Greek car. His older brother's Roy Greek car disappeared from his Westchester, Ohio home in May, 1996. So it was almost 10 years ago. His body was found a week later in the Great Miami River. They ruled his death a suicide. So his brother went into a river, as did he supposedly. And his brother's death was ruled a suicide, and he never believed it. He said, my, my brother would never have done that. My brother wouldn't have left his family. My brother left no suicide note. He wouldn't do that and hurt people like 
that. I don't believe it. He said his brother's death was a murder. It was never proven to be a murder. Um, and his brother went into a river, which is what is assumed he did. So now you see some interesting things in the Ray Greekar case. Now, what actually happened to Ray Greekar? Um, oh, let, before I go to that, I want to mention one other thing, because this is a huge issue in the Ray Greekar case. Um, some believe that his case is linked to Luna's case because of how they both took a ride in their cars within a couple of years of each other and both ended up either disappeared or not alive. Okay. Uh, they say there's similarities. Um, that, um, that Greek cars disappearance over here might be uh, linked to the unsolved death of J Jonathan Luna, an assistant U S attorney who was found dead in Lancaster County, uh, Lancaster County Creek in December, 2003. So he would be first and he would be second. A uh, Greek car had recently been involved in a police operation busting a heroin dealing ring. And the criminals concerned were investigated with any links to his disappearance, but none were found. Okay. So this is one of the things both of them dealt with, did do, do um, cases where there were, was drug dealing involved. And people always say, oh, you know, you put away drug deals, they're going to come after you. But I'm going to point out how I do not believe that is true with either one of these cases, because the way they were, they went missing or got killed doesn't match what drug dealers would do. But they're saying, oh, maybe they're linked because they both did drug dealing cases. The other suggestion is that Greek Car's decision to decline to prosecute Sandusky. Remember Sandusky? The, you know, the, the coach that um, got a little snuggly with some underage boys. He originally had that case. He actually did a lot of work on that case and he even set up a whole, kind of a sting operation where Sandusky basically said, I'm sorry I did that. I feel really bad. You know, I didn't mean, you know. he declined to prosecute. Now, Sandusky was eventually prosecuted for that years later. And it was a huge story. But back in the day, this would be, let me see if I can see what day it was, uh, when it was. Um, he closed the case in 1998. Way, and then Sandusky went on and did it to more kids. And then he finally got caught. But at the time he was investigating it, two boys age 11 were interviewed by police accused Sandusky of touching them during a shower in a football locker room. Age 11, the boys were. Sandusky later admitted taking the shower and asked for forgiveness from the mother of one boy while police secretly listened from the other room. He set that up. So a child psychologist who was interviewed um, said one of the boys, uh, who interviewed one of the boys, said that Sandusky was a likely pedophile. But a second opinion was sought, and two days after Dr. John C. Sock wrote a con contradictory report, Greek Car closed the case, claiming there wasn't enough evidence. Now, I'm not going to get into whether there was enough evidence at that point in time to prosecute Sandusky. He declined to prosecute. He closed the case. And eventually Sandusky was indeed convicted of the very thing that he closed the case on. Some people think there's a whole mafia thing going on here with Sandusky and all these people and that they came after him and finally killed him. Other people think maybe he had some issues, which is why he closed the Sandusky case. I'll get into that. So those are basically, um, so those are a couple theories. Uh, but the real thing is what happened to, what happened to him and what was behind the moment that he disappeared. All right, let me tell you about his disappearance. At 11.30 a.m. on April 15th, 2005, Greek car called his, his girlfriend, Patty, at home to inform her that he was driving through the Brush Valley area northeast of Central Hall. Now, supposedly, he did this to clear his mind, okay? Um, he took rides. He liked to take rides in the country to clear his mind. Is that true? Mm, I will honestly say I don't know, <laughs> okay? I don't know how true that is, that he took these rides that made him feel better, theoretically. Um, let's see, I'm trying to find my, hold on a second, is this it? Yeah, here we go. Oh, it's not very well done here. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to my other pictures just so you can see where he was riding around. Um, so, he was, this should be it. Okay. 
He lived in Belafonte, which is over there on the left side of the screen. Central Hall is Center Hall is where he worked. And then if you go all the way over to the right, there's Lewisburg. That's where his car was eventually found. And it's, and he, and there's the river that eventually his uh, laptop was found in. Now, it's about an hour from Center Hall, from his workplace, and it's even farther from his the home in Belafonte. I know, I guess it's about an hour if you take the other direction. That's an hour both ways. Um, it's a ride for an hour all the way over to Lewisburg. He supposedly is coming back. I don't know. Maybe the guy likes to ride around. You know what I mean? And just ride through the countryside and think. Or does how often does he do this? How how often or is something else happening while he's taking the rides? He's never been linked to another. He's, he's not <laughs> he's not been linked to um, affairs or anything like that. So maybe he just just likes to clear his mind by going out in the countryside. I don't know. But this particular day, he went over to a place called Lewis Burke. All right. And he also supposed he was an antiques guy. He liked looking at antiques and, you know, and she lived in a kind of an old fashioned home. So maybe he liked to get antiques to put in the house. All right. So anyway, he drove away and he didn't return home. And that evening, a Fornicola reported him missing because um, she did expect him to come home and he did not. The following day, they identified his car uh, was in an end. It was in the, it was in the parking lot of an antique shop, which is interesting in itself because it that is a place he would go to. So here's his car that you can see right next to his car. Um, and this is the place. It was called Street of Shops. It's an antique, you know, a bunch of antique shops. You see a gravel gravel there. That's a, there's a parking lot with gravel in it. He parked there. Now, if you look on this map, this is Lewisburg. That's where it is. And right here is where the river is. You see the river right here? And there's, there's these... Um, couple bridges going over the river. All right. So they find his car there, right here in the lot. And inside the car is his county issued cell phone, but not his laptop com uh, computer, his keys or his wallet. Uh, the vehicles adjacent to two bridges over the Susquehanna River bore some resem resemblance to the location of the vehicle of Grecar's older brother, Roy, when he committed suicide in 1996. This is a very interesting point that some believe he's just reenacting his brother's suicide. He drove to this point and he jumped in the river. And it was just what his brother did. My question is, is that, is he reenacting what his brother did or does he want you to think that? Because if he walked away, he would want you to think that. Okay, let's keep that in mind. Um, in the days following the discovery of Greek car's vehicle, they searched the river and its banks but found no sign of him and they never have found him. Police also noted that a sniffer dog's behavior around where Greek car's car was found in this lot here um, suggests that he might have gotten into another vehicle with someone else. In other words, that he didn't park and walk over here and jump in. Although stuff from him was found there. So, but there was some evidence theoretically that he got into another vehicle, according to sniffer dogs. Um, Pennsylvania authorities asked the FBI to analyze his bank accounts, credit cards, and cell phone records found no clue to where he may have been. So he's never touched anything since that day, which would in, tend to indicate he's dead, right? However, the fisherman found his county issued laptop in the Susquehanna River beneath a bridge between Lewisburg and Milton, but the hard drive was missing. So yes, they did, they did find, um, Oops, so wrong, wrong picture. Hold on one second. Let me find the right picture. Eh, which I can't find. <laughs> oh, no, here it is. <laughs> okay. In theory, this is where he threw the laptop over because a laptop was found in the river. You could say, well, somebody threw the laptop in. Okay, fine. Laptop was in, but the hard drive was not there. They found just a laptop without the hard drive. By the way, this is an area where you, you could easily throw something over. It's near, near where he parked the car. But if you jumped in, you wouldn't actually drown. <laughs> it's not that high up and it's not that deep. So you could you would have trouble drowning there, which is why it's an odd spot to pick for a suicide. But it's a great spot to just throw your laptop in the river. So, but it was found without a hard drive. And then 
Two months later, someone recovered a hard drive on the banks of the Susquehanna River about 100 yards um, from the location of the laptop. And the investigators hypothesized that it had come from his computer. Well, yeah, it was his, it was a lap, it was the hard drive from his computer. Well, they couldn't maybe prove it because both the both the laptop and the hard drive are like really mucked up and destroyed. So they couldn't, they, they tried to recover stuff off of there and they tried and tried and tried. They never recovered anything off the hard drive or the laptop. So now let's talk about why was Ray Greekar going to Susquehanna River in Lewisburg to begin with? Now, let me show you where he was staying with in Belafonte with his, his uh, girlfriend. Okay. Uh, let me try to find it. Yeah, here we are. Okay. This is Belafonte. You see that large river like goes through Belafonte? <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a nice river. It has water in it. And even if you didn't want to dump something in that river, there's a, there's a really, um, uh, there's a big, huge lake quite nearby. You could drive up to the lake and chuck it in the lake. So with all the water nearby, why would Ray Greetcar choose to get in his car and drive an hour away to go to the Susquehanna River? What was the point of going here to dump a laptop? Now, let's think this through. Um, I'm going to go to the murder thing first because some people think he was murdered. So he tells his girlfriend, I'm taking a drive. He takes a drive. Um, some people claim they saw him. And I, all the claims are so questionable that I, it's not even worth dealing with. Um, some claim that they saw him um, since they saw his car. Some people saw, thought they saw him with some woman with dark hair walking around. A, one, one person only thought they saw him with some dark haired woman and they never identified her. Um, somebody else thought they saw him in a different car passing by the courthouse at a different time. So some of them would, you could say, well, that's proof that he didn't commit suicide, that he was actually you know, running off. Some people say, that, well, he was with somebody and that's the person who killed him. Uh, there was a statement that in his car on the right side, it smelled like cigarette smoke. And on the right side of the passenger side, there was some cigarette ashes. And the claim is that maybe somebody was in the car with him. And he doesn't like, he didn't smoke and he didn't like people smoked. Why was somebody smoking in his vehicle? Uh, or did somebody, did he roll down the window and somebody leaned in, or, you know, dropped a few, who knows? Did he just say hello to somebody in the parking lot was asking directions? All of these things lead you to say, well, maybe somebody else was involved in, in killing him. But then we have the problem with the laptop and the hard drive. Why do we have a problem with that? It's because prior to him disappearing, they did a search and they found that he had used his home computer at the at his residence, which he shared with his, his girlfriend. And he performed internet searches on the topics of such as how to wreck a hard drive, how to fry a hard drive, water damage to a notebook computer, and, it, and also something about something that would erase uh, uh, the entire hard drive and supposedly even may have gotten hold of that item um, to do that. And you also ask somebody around the office the same thing. So he is, his mind was saying, I'm going to get rid of whatever's on my laptop and my hard drive. Now, some people say that's because he was leaving his job. You know, he was, he was going to retire. And because he was working in very sensitive stuff, he didn't want that sensitive stuff to be on his computer. But it's a pretty weird way to eliminate those things from a computer. Um, the questions he was asking, the obsession he seemed to have with it, uh, that if you look at everybody who leaves office, don't they have a normal way of doing things? And yet this does not seem normal. It seemed like he did not want people to find out what was on his computer the laptop, or the hard drive. Now, mind you, he wasn't retired yet. He still had time to go. Why didn't he wait till he was retired to when he had to return in that actual computer, the laptop? Why didn't he wait? Why was he jumping the gun? There was something there that was bothering him. And that, to me, 
is concerning. Also, the fact that he's looking to how to get rid of the hard drive, to erase everything, get rid of the laptop, the hard drive, make sure there's nothing left. And then he goes to a river where his stuff is found. That is not a homicide. <laughs> Somebody else didn't decide to grab, to erase his stuff and dump it in there. He, I have, would have to say 100% belief, he dumped that, his laptop and the hard drive, after he cleaned it as best he could and destroyed it as best he could, he dumped them in the Susquehanna River. Why? That's a pretty shady thing to do. You know, when you work with law enforcement, you work in the criminal justice system. For myself as a, as a profiler, you want to be above board. You want your family to think you're above board. You want your uh, people you work with to think you're above board. Why, after an illustrious career that he had, would he do this thing that makes him look like he's doing something shady as heck? I wouldn't want to leave that behind me. Because I want people to say, well, Pat Brown was a great criminal profiler. We never had any negative thoughts about her. But I'm going to tell you, I live near the Susquehanna River, too. <laughs> and if I tell my family I'm going to take a drive and you find my car next to Susquehanna River and you find my laptop without its hard drive in the Susquehanna River with a fried hard drive, I'm going to say you're going to think Pat Brown is a shady human being. Pat Brown is a shady criminal profiler. It will ruin my reputation forever. So why would Ray Greetcar do such a thing? He could have just talked to work, decided, you know, I have to turn this back in. I've got, you know, some confidential stuff on here. Do you take care of it? How do I take care of it? He should have talked to the people he works with as to how he should deal with that. Because I do know that people work with, um, often have stuff on their computers when you work in law enforcement that you do not want other people to access for the sake of the families, for the sake of the cases. But how often do police detectives, profilers, district attorneys fry their stuff and throw it into a river? I'm going to say almost never. Something's fishy about that. So Ray Greekar himself was having issues with whatever was on there. Nobody murdered him because of that. He himself wanted to get rid of it. So on a particular day that he decides he's going to get rid of these things, he drives from where he lives prior to when he could have, he could have, it's true. People say, well, you know, he could have just retired and gone off on his, if he wanted to run away, for example, he wasn't even married to Patty. They, they live together. He could have, and he's already been divorced twice. He could have just said, honey, it's not working out. Taken all his what money he had, which was a hundred thousand dollars, supposedly, which people question because they're like, how come he only has a hundred thousand dollars in his bank account? Kind of low, you know, for a guy who's got a good salary for all these years. Okay. you would taken that money. And what, I don't know if he was getting some kind of pension or anything. I don't know what the Pennsylvania does. Um, and he could have, or you know, Social Security, of course, whatever. And he could have moved wherever he wanted to. And he had, he had family uh, in Slovenia. Apparently, he his, his relatives, uh, ancestors from Slovenia uh, and, and Europe. And he apparently had visited there and he could speak the language. So he could have just moved and said, I'm done. I'm, I'm retired. See you guys. But that's not what happened. What happened is he took a drive. His car ends up next to a river where he dumps something important to him that he doesn't want other people to discover. What was it? And this is one of the things that I could talk about what happens prior to somebody, so particular incident. Again, homicide makes no sense. Nobody's going to commit. If they wanted to kill him, they would do it a different way. But the whole way it was done. Clearly, he was by himself until he got to the river with a plan to dump things in the river, and then he vanishes. So there's two things to me. He either did kill himself, and they just never found his body. So he, he went to the river so he could show everybody, it's just like my brother, jumped in the river. Or he disappeared. Now, there's, this is, I'm going to go to you guys in a minute. I'm going to get your thoughts on this. So I want, I'm going to present some of the issues with which, which one it would be. Because I'm going to say homicide is out, in my opinion. I don't see a, any, any, anything for that at all. I would say there's something on that computer he did not want people to see. What the heck was it? Now, some, I, some people would say because he let Sandusky off the hook, did he have some stuff on his computer 
that was damning. I'm not saying that he did. I'm just saying some people think that because of Sandusky makes him a little shady. Or some, well, I wouldn't say some people. I could even say myself would think this. Um, is it possible he's actually gay? Uh, the many gay men have been married for years, with, have, especially a person who's in uh, in um, district, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're a, a, a prosecutor, and back, this is not, remember, when, when did he, when did he uh, go missing? Uh, that was 2005. And we're talking about the 90s. Okay, things were changing. Nowadays, you have gay prosecutors and nobody gives a crap. But back then, eh, in a small town, eh, how would it be a problem for, to, be, to be able to succeed if you came out as gay early on? Or is this a, a way to have a, quote, life that's acceptable to the, your constituents? Um, and he had some, some secret life that people say he was a very, very dapper fellow. He was very concerned about his clothing. He was very, very sweet and kind to elderly women and children. You know, the kind of things everybody goes, that's the guy that I want to get. Dang it, he turned out to be gay. Not saying it's true. Have no other clue. He could just be a heterosexual guy who has, who likes to dress well and is very, he was very private, apparently, um, a little distant a bit, bit, supposedly with people in certain ways, but flirty in other ways. Um, he could be as heterosexual as all get out or not, because there's been a great many men who have come out as gay in their 50s and 60s when they finally think I can do so. I can, my career is over, whatever. Was there something on his laptop he did not want to get out? Did he want to start a new life as whomever he wanted to be? I don't know. But something's fishy about that laptop and what was on it. So the question comes down to if he committed suicide. Some would say he went and committed suicide in the river in order to look like his brother. But he said he never said his brother committed suicide. So it's kind of odd that he would then reenact what his brother did when he doesn't even believe his brother committed suicide. But maybe he thought other people would believe that. He wants to commit, pretend to commit suicide and then run off. That's an interesting concept. Or did he just say, I'm going to join you, brother. I'm going to do it the way you did it. Now, there was no suicide note from his brother or from him. And now the question is, and here's something you always have to take, in, take, take into consideration. Just because the police didn't find a suicide note doesn't mean there wasn't a suicide note. Sometimes people leave a suicide note so they can let their loved one know what they're gonna do. And then they say, get rid of the suicide note. <laughs> in other words, I want you to be able to collect on insurance or I don't want people to know why I'm doing it. Whatever the reasons are, they put it in their suicide note and then they say, get rid of the suicide note. And sometimes that's exactly what the relative will do. They'll burn that sucker up. By the time the police come, they say, we never saw a suicide note. So I don't know if there was a suicide note or not. Now, it's interesting. Ray Greekar supposedly asked about this police officer who he found to be, um, this police officer back in Ohio had disappeared by a lake. And the question was, did he disappear? Did he take do a walk away or did he kill himself? And there were supposedly some issues with the uh, the something written. There was something written on his uh, his typewriter back in the days when there were typewriters. I'm going to show you two different versions of this. Uh, the first one, I don't know if it was actually written on the typewriter uh, on piece of paper, but the second one was definitely written on the ribbon, like he wrote it, but nobody saw it. Now look at the first one. I'm going to show you how difficult these things are. Wiley, this guy's name was Wiley. He was a, a retired police officer. I don't know if he's retired. He's only 47. He was an aspiring poet. When he disappeared, his manuscript for a novel he was writing also vanished, according to published accounts. His literary bent prompted an investigator to check the ribbon in Wiley's typewriter. Now, he was, was a police, police officer. I think it was police chief at some point. I'm not sure quite what he did. But anyway, Greekar knew about it and was interested in it had mentioned it to somebody. But okay, he wrote on the typewriter, where I've gone, he typed, is of no critical importance. And it's very doubtful that I'll ever return. Now, I'm going to ask you folks in the, in, the, in the chat room right now. Does that sound like he's a walkaway or a suicide? Which one does it sound like? Tell me from that one. Let me again, let me put it up there. Just because I want you to understand how the difficulty with, with these things. He wrote, where I've gone is of no critical importance. And it's very doubtful that I'll ever return. Would you say suicide or walkaway? 
Okay. GMFR says walk away. K Klein says walk away. Yeah, well, it sounds like a walk away to me too. Now, now take, check this out. This was supposedly also on his typewriter. Look at the bottom. So Chief Wiley wrote a letter to a friend stating he was leaving the area, saying he'd be 500 miles away by the time the letter reached a person. Again, a walk away, right? But then look at the bottom one. By the time you receive this, I will, in a sense, have gone away. Fortunately or unfortunately, it's a one-way trip, so I'm told, with no possibility of ever returning. It's a one-way trip, so what I'm told, and no possibility of returning. Does that sound like a suicide, or does that sound like a walk away? Which way does that one sound? Now it sounds like a suicide. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, Emily says maybe didn't care one way or the other. Maybe not. But see, this is the problem. When you look at evidence, you've got one thing that looks at you, oh, yeah, that's a walk away. And then you look at the other one, you go, that's a suicide. Well, which one was it for the Wiley dude? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to go into this case. I'd have to analyze every bit of the evidence to be able to even come close to understanding whether it was a walk away or a suicide. So don't know. Um, I just don't know. Um, and we're talking, we're talking, we're talking about, oh, perhaps um, Dr. Vera says, might be trying to spare his family from thinking the worst. It's hard to know. It could, you know, that's the problem. When you do something squirrely, and I'm going to say, Ray Greekhart did something squirrely. He wanted to eliminate what was on his hard drive and his laptop in a way that made people suspicious. And I've always said to people, look, you may not have done, meant to do something squirrely, but when you did it, it looked squirrely. You're going to live with that. That's what's that's that's what you leave behind you. If you find my if you find everything, all my hard drives completely burned up, I'm going to say unless I told people, look. I've got cases on my hard drive from from families and I don't want them to see it. That's why I'm getting rid of it. If you just see all kinds of, and then you go and you guess hey, something squirrely. Well, something squirrely about what great card did. So he erases everything and then goes to a river and jumps in or throws everything in and runs away. Something's fishy. No matter what the guy was, he had a, he had a, a supposedly a girlfriend who loved him, a daughter who loved him. And, he had a reasonable money to retire on. He wasn't, he wasn't, he hadn't stolen anything. He wasn't, there was nothing, there was no, there were no investigations for, uh, about him. It basically, he has whole life ahead of him. He was only 59 for Christ's sakes. I'm 67. I think I, I have my whole life ahead of me. I mean, now there's an interesting possibility. I'm going to bring this one up. I'm going to see what you think about this one. Okay, let's take away anything squirrely about okay let's take away the possibility he could have been gay and was hiding that because he had pictures of naked men or boys or whatever let's take away that let's look at another possibility did he have alzheimer's did he have early onset alzheimer's and did not want to admit it did he not want to let people know it's reason he wasn't going to run again was because he had alzheimer's did he not want to take the long slow miserable road of alzheimer's there were two things that people said about him one is that in order to go to that location that he took his drive to, he looked up on MapQuest how to get there. And people who knew him said, what, what the heck? He, he, he knew how to get there. Why would he need to look it up on Map, MapQuest? There are a couple of theories. One is he was giving that map to somebody else to meet him so that he could jump into another car and be taken away and disappear. Or maybe he couldn't remember how to get there. People said he'd been sleeping a lot lately. Or his girlfriend said he'd been sleeping a lot. Sleeping a lot means one of a couple things. One is depression. One is not feeling well. Is it possible he was starting to get paranoid? Did he start having dementia? Did he start not understanding things and realizing that he was going downhill and thought to my, himself, I, I, you know, I, I can't let people see what's happening to me. I, I'm not, I don't want to retire into to Alzheimer's. I'm just going to end this now. Um, maybe he was paranoid. Maybe he thought people were coming after him. Who knows what he thought? And therefore he fried everything and decided to jump in the river and his body just was never found. That's another possibility. Um, and he jumped in that river because maybe he just thought the other, he thought it was a good river to jump in. Who knows? Um, maybe he did leave him suicide note, but nobody knows. So I have a look at this possibilities. Now, mind you, it's another interesting thing. 
he paid off his girlfriend's mortgage. His the car he drove was in her this car. He put it in her name and it's paid off like he was leaving it to her. So in case something happened to him, it would be hers and she wouldn't have to deal with the courts. The hundred thousand dollars in his account was a shared account with his daughter. OK, a shared account with his daughter. Isn't that interesting? No, I don't know too many people do that. That's a that's a that's kind of a rarity, in my opinion. Um, who does that? Well, I'm thinking. Maybe he didn't want her to have to deal with things. Maybe he thought I was going to put her on the account. I, and this is the information I don't know. When did he put her on the account? Was it way back when? Or was it fairly recently? In other words, was he taking care of business so that he knew when he left this life, these two women that were important to him were taken care of? It had nothing to do with any creepy life of his. No, he wasn't like running away to live a gay life. He wasn't running away to be with young boys. He wasn't doing any of this stuff. He just wanted to take care of the, those he cared about and walk away and jump in the river. Maybe he just, maybe I say, maybe he had Alzheimer's coming on and he just wanted to clear out everything because he wasn't sure what anything was anymore. Maybe he did get paranoid. I don't know. But they've never really fought really hard uh, to find out what happened to him that much. Uh, his, his, his daughter um, had him declared dead six years after the fact and they kind of went on with their own lives. Um, I don't know if they know more than we know. Um, but I'm going to say this is not a homicide. Absolutely not a homicide. Uh, could he have run away? Um, well, one of the concepts too, is that if she had control of the, if she was in the bank, had the bank account, it's possible he could leave the country and go to Slovenia or wherever. And somehow she could take money out of that bank account and send it to him wherever he was. Uh, there are people who say for all the money he should have made, uh, maybe he had hidden that money in offshore accounts someplace was planning a disappearance at some time. And therefore, he had enough money to go live whatever life he wanted to live. Again, possible. Um, but because we do not have the inside track on this, um, I cannot say whether he ran away or he committed suicide. Why they didn't find his body is a good question. That location, they should have found it. <laughs> okay, that's the, the, that's the one thing that sits in me that goes, they should have found the body by now. That just at that part of the river. I'm just, I'm not, I'm just not thinking they should have found his body. They found the laptop. They found the hard drive. They didn't find his body. So my question is, did that happen? Or did somebody, did he actually have somebody pick him up, drive him somewhere else? And he crossed the border and left. And um, now, oh, mind you, here's an interesting one. They did think they found him in Utah. Th th this is fun uh, because this will go to show you how things work. They found a homeless guy in Utah. And they said, my God, that's him. Now you look at that, that guy, look at this. Would you think that is Ray Grecar? I swear to God, it looks just like him. And it's not him. This is a completely different guy. They found out who it was. He's a doppelganger. I mean, it's just, but this is why when, when, when there's always witnesses around who say, oh, I know what happened to, I saw him. I saw him over here. I saw him over there. I'm like, did you? Or do they just look exactly alike? You know what I mean? That's craziness. But man, they do look exactly alike. It's nuts. Absolutely nuts. Um, let's see. Um, I'll go to some of your thoughts here. But this, I point out, I can't see a homicide any place in this. All I see is that he either committed suicide, and I can't see any good reason to, for him to commit suicide except that something was wrong. Something was really wrong. Um, and he just didn't want to live with that or he just disappeared because he wanted to live whatever life he wanted to live can't tell which one it is neither way have we found any proof but it's not a homicide i'll guarantee that um oh that's interesting oh my brother and i and our mom's checking account so we can take care of stuff when she's on vacation or having health issues that does happen um my kids have no access to my checking account my savings account or anything <laughs> i love my three children they're all wonderful and i trust them entirely Mm, not touching my stuff. No, <laughs> I'll be dead first. But <laughs> but they're all, it's all for them when I disappear. But I want to make sure they don't disappear me too quickly. All right. So um, let's see. Uh, uh, some people are talking about how their family has had dementia. Um, oh, that's a good point. Marie says, Robin Williams killed himself and only from the autopsy they found out he, he had uh, Louis body dementia. Uh, 
this is, and, and there's no proof. There's supposedly nothing that they've come up with medically that has proven he had dementia or anything. It was like, you know, a terminal, terminal situation. But it's, the question would be, did he just know? I mean, the, often the question with dementia is, do people know that they're losing it? Um, some people do. Some people refuse to accept it. Um, but I certainly have been, my mother, my mother had Alzheimer's. My father had dementia. I had a Spanish teacher in the classroom because she became paranoid about what I was saying. <laughs> um, and I went to the people that ran the place. I said, look, she can't, she can't teach dementia. And they went, she does? And I'm like, guarantee you. I, I've watched over, over a number of classes how she can't find her stuff. She gets confused. She gets upset about that because she's struggling and she get, she's very paranoid. Um, so I don't know with a person who has, you know, had a law career and a very, very, this guy was very, very particular about everything. He was one of those, did everything, you know, very, very, like I'm all over the place. <laughs> Anybody who knows me, I'm, I'm a kind of stream of consciousness person. I come up with stuff, but I don't do it very exactly. You know what I mean? Cause I just get bored that way. You might not tell if I have Alzheimer's, but probably this guy. You would start knowing if he wasn't doing things right. He'd say, wait a minute, that's not you. You don't do that. So I, I don't know. Did he notice something going downhill for himself and make a choice? But the, the getting rid of the hard drive, working so hard and throwing these in the river is, is a telltale sign of something that is more than, that's not normal. It's just not normal. So he was either running away from something or ending his life. Um, don't know which one it was because we just don't have proof either direction. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, if you had to mention, you'd think his girlfriend would have noticed something. I have experiences and you do notice something. This is true. But then there's pe people who work really hard to hide it. And there are people who work really hard not to notice it. And I don't know. Behind the scenes, you know, the police talked to the girlfriend. I mean, she'd been living with him, so she should know. Um, the police probably did long. They did. I, I know they did a, a polygraph with her, and they did a polygraph with the stepdaughter, but not the daughter, um, which I, I found kind of interesting because since she shows a bank account, you'd think they want to do a polygraph with her too. Like, are you sending money to your daddy? <laughs> are there money orders going overseas? You know, um, but the the as I point out, these are two cases, uh, the, the Greek car case and the Luna case, where information is so incredibly limited. I mean, it, it's odd in a sense. And I don't know this because it has to do with people who work with the government. A lot of people say it's because there's all kinds of squirrely things going on. Um, but I don't know that that's true. That's just all the conspiracy theory stuff going around about these, these two guys because they did have weird ends of life. I mean, this guy had a great career great career people liked him and suddenly this happens boom when he should have you know he's in good health too the guy was good looking he was a thin uh healthy healthy young my young man he was 59 so to me he was young you know if i got to date him at 59 you know, hey i could get it i could be a cougar for him but <laughs> he was in good shape now luna on the other hand was was truly a young man a very handsome going places young man so it would seem with a good, good family life, so it would seem. So when these things happen to people in government who are dealing with a lot of dangerous people, you know, uh, uh, criminal gangs and, and cartels and all kinds of other nasty stuff, and, and he was up, in uh, his area not so much, but his area is Baltimore, so we're talking. If you watch The Wire, that's Baltimore. So he had much more scary things going on. So I'm going to get to him in just a second here. I'm going to check out a few comments more. Um, uh, he had two divorces and a girlfriend, and he supported his daughter. Maybe that's why he didn't have much money left. One would think that's true. Here, I look, tried to look into that. Um, the first divorce, interesting enough, he was willing to stay home and watch his ba the baby while his wife worked, which, again, <laughs> is kind of an unusual thing for a man to do. Let me just say that. But anyway, he did. He stayed home. His wife worked, um, and so she had a job. Uh, apparently, when they divorced, uh, there wasn't. There wasn't like a big, huge, al there was no alimony on the first divorce and no alimony on the second divorce either. Um, so I don't know. Uh, 
he could have been a super generous guy who just always gave and gave and gave. He might have been that kind of guy or not. And see, this is, this is why I say when we're outside, we can, we, I can throw out things for you to say, we could consider this, we could consider that. But in the long run, what do I know? I only know two real things. I don't, I know it's not a homicide. As a profile, I could say that is not a homicide. He planned to leave that day. He made a choice. And I don't know what that choice was. Did he, but something was, something was on that computer and that laptop and on that hard drive. He did not want people to see. And I don't mean people outside of his work situation. I mean, something in his private life. I don't know what that is because otherwise I don't think it would have gone to those, to all of that. Something's fishy there. Um, and the timing that he chose to do it is concerning as well. He was close to retirement. He could have simply freaking retired and gone on his merry way. Something is happening in this man's life or in his brain. And I don't know which one it is because from outside, he looks like a, a super healthy, I say 59 is fairly young. He's going to retire in a year. He has enough money. He's going to have a hell of a pleasant life. And yet something happened, but it wasn't homicide. So why did it happen? And I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't answer that because I don't have access. And this is why I talk about how much information do we have to access? And in this case, very little. I just know enough to say it's not a homicide and there's something suspicious about the hard drive and about the timing, but I don't know what. And so unless I could get more information on this case, I wouldn't know where to go with it. Um, just to be realistic. Now let's go to, let's go to Luna <laughs> because this is Luna C. Okay. Oh, this guy. Oh, man. Luna. This is a much trickier case because he ended up with 36 stab wounds. And yet it was called a suicide. But there's reasons for it. And so this is why I want you to understand. Again, we have a strange situation where this guy, prior to him disappearing that night, getting in his car and driving off, things were not quite right. Okay. He was... Um, a, like a super smart up and coming lawyer who did become, um, let me, let me find my Wikipedia page on him. Okay, here we go. All right. Cause I want you to understand his basic background. He was an assistant United States attorney in Baltimore, Maryland, who was found dead under mysterious circumstances. Luna had been stabbed 36 times with his own pocket knife before he drowned in a Creek next to his car in rural Lan Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Investigations have proved inconclusive, and there's debate on whether Luna's death was a murder or a suicide. Now, he grew up in the Bronx. His father was Filipino. His, his mother was African-American. He got his undergraduate degree from Fordham University. Then he went to the University of North Carolina School of Law. Uh, he worked at Arnold and Porter in Washington, D.C., which is a pretty, pretty good place to go work. Then he served at the Federal Trade Commission. Then he became a prosecutor in the Brooklyn Borough of New York City before moving to Baltimore to become an assistant United States attorney. He married Angela Hopkins, an obstetrician in 1993, and they had two children. This guy is like super, super on the way up, successful guy. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he worked hard and he was proud that he was able to accomplish what he did in his life. And he said that to people. He was, he was supposed to went to school, even as, as a teenager, like wore a suit and tie. And I thought it was kind of a little weird, but he was like really into being somebody and coming from a kind of a little bit of a rougher neighborhood. He said, I basically, I, I broke out of that and I succeeded in life. And he did. What a heck of a life he had going for him. You know, I mean, and then apparently as his parents came down, he put his parents up in a place in Columbia, Maryland, which is a nice location because he was helping taking care of them. Sounds like a great guy. It's like, what the heck? What the heck went wrong with him? All right. Um, <laughs> okay, we're going we're gonna to get into the... Uh, so we're set, I've seen... So, uh, Luna was killed, says Fairy Princess. He wasn't wearing his glasses when he needed to drive. Again, I'm going to point out, okay, according to Wiki... <laughs> All right. Yes, that's true. And also, do we know? All right. This is a problem that we have with outside information when we don't get the details. All right. Um, let me explain, first of all, what happened to him. And I'm going to go to the issues of what happened, where and 
Why does this make any sense? Now, mind you, um, let me tell you about what happened prior, just so I can talk about the reason when I say he had some things happening that seemed that he was in charge of that he was making choices on. In other words, if he was if he was coming home from work, I'm going back to a uh, Greek car here. If he was driving home from work and he had his laptop in his car and he was driving home and his car got hit by another vehicle and he was dragged out and shot in the head and his, and his laptop was stolen. I'm going to say it's a homicide and somebody wanted the laptop and then they destroyed it and threw it in the river. But that's not how it went down. The same thing is true here. So prior to the, the events prior to this, um, um, he had, I'm trying to find the, the part right prior to that. Um, um, I have to, I'll have to find another, another wiki. Wiki is not putting this in here, but let me just explain what happened to him that day. And then we'll go back to that. All right. At 1138 on the night he died. He went, he was at home and then he went back to the courthouse in Beaumont. He left the Beaumont count courthouse and went northeast on I-95. So I'm going to show you a little picture of, so he was at the courthouse. He was at home and then he, he told his wife he had to go back to the courthouse and he did. All right. Now, um, hold on a sec. Is it this one? No, oh, nope. It's gone missing on me. Oh, is this, hold on a second. I'm trying to find, it was here before because I remember I showed it to you guys and it was the wrong one. So it's got to be here. Hold on. Nope, that's not it either. That's not it. Ah, okay. Something's gone missing. Okay. People say that when I do that, then I talk funny and my sound goes off. Maybe it's true. All right. This is a picture of where he went when he left he left at 1138. Now, just pay attention to this picture in front, in front of you. He left Baltimore at 1138. He left the cart house. And he got, he used his easy pass and he got onto I-95 and went up to Delaware. And you can see the little, little things along the way here. Uh, when you get up to Wilmington, that's Delaware. Um, so he went on, he went up I-95. He used his easy pass, which is glued to your car. Uh, but he didn't use the easy pass on the New Jersey and Pennsylvania turnpike. So when he got into New Jersey, which is just past the Wilmington, uh, it's kind of hard to explain this. Um, and then he took a turn. He went up into Jersey all the way to the right. And then he took a turn and went back into Pennsylvania. So he then he, at three toll interchanges, he switched to buying toll tickets, which is really weird because people say, well, this, was there somebody else in the car? Didn't even know he had easy pass at that point. He's driving along and, and suddenly he's, um, <laughs> he, he's not, he's not using the easy pass anymore. Why would, why would that be? Uh, that's just a little weird. Hold on one sec. I've got to find this picture because it's going to bug me. If I disappear, I disappear for a second. Okay. I feel happier now. No, it, it didn't show up for some reason. Okay. So, so he's leaving at 1138. He drives along and drives along all the way up here. He uses easy pass, but when he gets up here, he doesn't use easy pass for three of the tolls, which makes very little sense. Myself, I can't get, unless he didn't want that to show up on his easy pass. Let me point that out. Did he, for some reason, did he not want where he was going to show up there? And that may be an issue. At 1257, he, with, he stopped at JFK Plaza in, in, in Newark, Delaware. Um, Newark, Delaware, as opposed to Newark, New Jersey. Newark, Delaware. So now he's in Delaware. He stops at a, a, a JFK Plaza and he takes out $200 in cash from his bank account. Now, the question is why? Why is this guy taking out money? Uh, some people could say he's going to have a sex tr tryst. And why would one say that? It's because apparently his name showed up on uh, dating sites. Uh, so his name, Jonathan Luna, although we don't know if it was the Jonathan Luna, showed up on dating sites looking for what ladies outside of his marriage. Was he looking for a tryst? Although I got to say, who the heck is going to drive at that time of night all the way up here? Mind you, he had something he had to turn in in the morning and he never turned it in. 
He was under pressure, under horrible pressure to get something accomplished. He went to the office for that reason, but never did it. I just, I find it really hard to believe that suddenly he said, oh, I'm going to skip that. I'm just going to go have sex up in Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania. I need 200 bucks for a lady. First of all, 200 bucks isn't a lot. So I don't know what he was getting. So anyway, that wouldn't make, that does not make sense to me. Did he take $200 out in cash because he was going to use it to rent, get a hotel room that he didn't want people to know he was in? Because if you put that in your credit card, your wife might find out. Although apparently he had credit cards that his wife didn't know about and a lot of debt on them. That's one of the things that happened prior to him uh, ending up dead, that he had a lot of credit cards and a lot of credit card debt. Also, he was in charge of a case where there was some $36,000 in cash they brought into the courtroom to show what these drug dealers were doing or whatever. And that money disappeared. And he was looking for a loan at that time, but suddenly he dropped looking for the loan and apparently came up with money that he shouldn't have had. So this is where the suspicious part comes on Jonathan Luna, that prior to the midnight ride, he had some issues with supposedly being on dating sites, supposedly having credit cards his wife didn't know about, spending a lot of money on what I don't know, uh, and then the money that disappeared. Now, there are some people who think that, oh, he was framed and all this money disappearing and all the rest. All this is a lie. He was totally framed. He was murdered for some reason to do with his court cases or the FBI or whatever. Um, and he was framed. Everything else is a frame. Could they be right? Well, sure. But I don't know. So apparently there were some issues before he took this midnight ride. Um, and uh, one of the questions I would have, and, and I don't know the same truth to this because there is no toxicology report that has been released. There is no toxicology report and there's no autopsy report that has gone out to the public, even though this was, how long ago was this? Let's see. Um, he died in 2003. It's been 20 years and I've never, there's no autopsy report been released to the public or, or, or toxicology report. It may be because it's an open case and they just won't release it. And it's none of our damn business, but I want to know whether there are drugs in the system. That is one of my number one questions. A lot of times when people work incredibly hard, long hours, especially attorneys. Seems to be attorneys and people working in restaurants because they like they never get any sleep. They work so many hours and they do a, there's a lot of cocaine flowing around and other amphetamines. That's just that's just a fact. I don't know that Jonathan Luna was doing any of these things, but it's important to question if you were going to do an investigation. In other words, the reason he's his money is in debt was it because he was using drugs to keep working the hours he was working to be the great lawyer. Um, did, did were drugs in his system when he took the midnight ride here doing this crazy going out what looks like a crazy ride to nowhere was he on drugs uh was there a psychotic break going on here was he under so much pressure because everything was going to hell in his life that is going to be found out about his dating life and the money and maybe he did steal the money i don't know did he flip out or was he indebted to someone who was going to see someone or was somebody in the car with him who murdered him? And that's the question. Okay, so let's go back to the ride. So now on the ride, it gets more interesting. That's a crazy ride. So he gets some money, $200 out of uh, uh, at the uh, JFK Plaza Service Center in uh, Newark, Delaware, 200 bucks. Then it, this is a 1257. 247, he crosses the Delaware River Bridge. There's some time missing in here. Like, like, the, like the trip should have taken way less time but suddenly an hour is missing. Like, where was he for that hour? Was he on the side of the road? Was he, what was he doing? And nobody knows. Then at 247, he crosses Delaware Bridge, Toll Bridge into the Pennsylvania Turnpike. And now he's going this way. And at 320, his debit card is used to buy gas at a Sunoco at the King of Prussia Service Plaza. Now, there becomes a big issue over this. Um, they bought gas there. And also, I think, is this the place he also bought a soda. All right. The story about over most of the internet is that he bought two tanks of gas and two sodas and that there's some footage. Not, they, the footage at the ATM doesn't seem to show anybody but him at the ATM, but somewhere in this, uh, at the King of Prussia service plaza, there's claims that there's some other person that's in the plaza at the same time. Like his car is here. Somebody else pulls in. There's another guy in the, in the, in the, in the plaza which considering it's a service plaza is not shocking. <laughs> you know? But people are saying he went in and bought two tanks of gas, one for himself, 
and he paid for the other guy's gas. And then he bought two sodas, one for himself and one for the other person. Okay. Apparently, okay, first of all, that's, that's, that's odd. Um, one would think if somebody were like going to kill him, he's like probably not been buying them gas and sodas. I mean, and if they were going to kill him, you think he would have an opportunity alone in the, in the, in, in the plaza to say, call the police. I'm, you know, <laughs> look, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a prosecutor. I'm a federal prosecutor. This guy's out there is going to kill me. Call the police for me because I left my phone back in the office. Oh, you say you did. Here's the other thing. That's weird. When he left, Baltimore. He left his phone and his glasses, which is pretty weird. Now, some people say, well, he went out to the garage and somebody got in his car with him. Okay. Well, that has nothing to do with his office. So somebody would have to come into his office and pu point out, pull out a gun and say, leave now, making him leave his phone and his glasses. And then they'd have to force him into the car and then take him on a long trip. Now people wonder where the video is from, like video from, uh, the uh, courthouse and all that. And I, there's no evidence of any, I don't know if there is some, but it's not very interesting or it's crap or what, I don't know, or whether they do have proof of two people coming out of the office. People ask why would he leave his phone and why would he leave his glasses? I don't know. Two possibilities. One is he didn't want to be, he didn't want his phone to be tracked. Uh, another is he, he was in a rush and forgot them. Uh, about the glasses issue, I have, I always wore glasses for driving. These are not them. I used to always wear glasses for driving when I was, from the time I was a teen all the way, probably till I was about 40. Uh, and uh, I used to try to take the uh, the eyeglass test without them. So in case I didn't have them, that you know, when they stopped, it wouldn't say on my license, you know, glasses required. So I actually went in to DMV one day and I'm doing the glasses test without the glasses. And I said, can you, can you, can you adjust that? It's a little blurry. And then I looked up and the guy went, really? I'm like, never mind. <laughs> what an idiot. Anyway, <laughs> but <clears throat> there were times I did not wear my glasses when I was driving. If you're not super blind, it's, it's not like you can't see the road, folks. I mean, this is this. I mean, I haven't even found a picture with Luna with glasses on. Uh, and I don't know. People say they, they don't know whether he let's Here's a, here's a couple pictures of Luna. Let's see. Here he is. No glasses. Here he is. No glasses. Now, mind you, it's possible that Luna were, were contacts, but nobody said he did. I can't find any information on that. So did he wear glasses under certain circumstances, but not others? What could he have seen the road anyway? And it just wasn't that big a deal. It's just, you know, when you put your glasses on, you can see a little better. You can read the signs a little further away. I don't know, but he left his glasses and he left his, um, and he left his, uh, phone at the office. So he did not have those with him. So now we have this, um, I'm sorry, wrong picture again. Ah, ah, ah. Where's my picture? There we go. Okay. So now he's up here. He's at this gas station and the big deal is how he's bought two tanks of gas two sodas. So now the, if, there's, if there was a guy in his car with him, what does that have to do with the ta no, second tank of gas? Because the second tank of gas would be in a second car. Would it not? You know, um, <laughs> that doesn't make no sense to me. So you would have to have two cars. He would have had to left ba leave Baltimore and have the other guy following him all the way up there for going all the way all over the place for no reason whatsoever that I can come up with. And now there's this guy still following him. So he goes in there and he buys this guy a tank of gas, and he buys a guy a drink. So now let's go to the soda issue. First of all, there's no real proof. The police say, I had to look all over the internet for this. There's really no proof that the second tank of gas ever existed or the second drink. So there you go. That I don't know where that came from, but it's everywhere on the internet except I found elsewhere that it says there was no actual proof that that was true. So uh, supposedly went in and bought one tank of gas and, 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 a, and a drink. But by the way, on the drink issue, sometimes they sell a twofer, you know, like if you buy two, you get it for two ninety nine dollars instead of, you know, one, one drink is uh, whatever it is. One drink is two seventy nine, dollars but if you buy two, it's $4. You know, you get a dollar off. That happens. I bought, I bought two drinks at a time and they're both for me. You know, I plan on drinking one now and one later. 
especially if I'm going to stay at a hotel where I'm going to put one of them in the, uh, like in the little refrigerator. I want one for the road and one to put in the refrigerator. It's not a big deal. That doesn't prove there's a second person. And this, I say the second thing of gas is not even a proven deal. So now, so now we don't, we have, according to the police, as, as far as I can see, is there, he's by himself going through these things. Now, it gets more confusing. Now, when he gets to, after he leaves King of Prussia at 320, he buys the gas. Then at 404, his car exited the turnpike on the Reading Lancaster, Lancaster Exchange. Okay. Uh, the toll ticket had a spot of blood on it, suggesting he was already injured. Okay, this is interesting. So somehow he's been stabbed in the vehicle that he supposedly is in alone or somewhere he's been stabbed and now he's exiting because there's a dot, the blood is on the ticket, okay? Uh, then his car ends up being parked at the back of Sansering and Weaver Well Drilling Company on Dry Tavern Road in, in, in Denver, Pennsylvania, wherever the heck that is, just someplace. He got off the turnpike and just going down a road and ends up, the car drove into the back of the parking lot and ends up driving into the creek. It's like hanging over into the creek, like the person lost control at that point. And that, and that person then got out of the vehicle and staggered and fell into the creek where he died in the creek, this would be Luna, with stab wounds and also his face went into the water. So he has some signs of drowning as well. Um, there is a claim that there was DNA from other blood in the car. And that also isn't unproven. That is supposedly not true. So again, we have things flying around the internet, which aren't absolutes of anything. So as far as I know, there wasn't a second tank of gas. There wasn't a second drink and there wasn't anybody else's blood or DNA in the car. Now, can somebody say that that's all a big lie by the whole, you know, whoever is trying to protect whoever killed Luna? Yes. But I have no proof of that. Um, so, um, so then they find him lying there. Originally what they said too was that he was stabbed in the chest and in the neck. And also there were 36, uh, 36 stab wounds with his own pocket knife around the chest and neck plus a head injury. And the death was due to drowning because he staggered and fell into the water. Um, so no suspect of motive for the uh, murder was determined. Federal authorities, FBI, leaned toward calling it a suicide and came to the conclusion he was alone from the time he left his office. And there was some video that seemed to prove that uh, until his body was found. But the local Lancaster County authorities, including two successive coroners, ruled as a homicide. Um, so then the rest of the stuff is all very questionable and nobody's ever figured out who did it. Now, one of the reasons I said it was uh, suicide was because a lot of the, the wounds were very shallow, like little, and I don't know. See, here's the problem. No autopsy. Now, if I could see the autopsy and I saw that there were a lot of little like, tick, you know, like, just, tick, 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 tick. like when you, when person is psychotic, have you ever seen people that peel, they take certain drugs and will I literally take a knife and peel their face off? I mean, it's unbelievable what a person of certain drugs um, will do to themselves. They will do some incredible things to their own bodies. Because I, I suppose, first of all, the drug takes away the feeling that you would normally have. The pain disappears. And then they'll think things like, oh, I'm, I'm wearing a mask. I have to get my mask off. <laughs> they'll take a knife and rip their whole face off. I like bath salts will do that to you. I mean, you can some strange crap happens. Um, but also in psychotic breaks, a person can become very agitated and they can do behaviors that are agitated, like taking a knife and just starting to go, ah, you know, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. You can stab yourself really quickly. It doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean it's deep. It just, it's, it's just somehow, you know how you, people get angry. They punch the hand into a wall. Does that hurt? Yes. Why do they do that? They know it's going to hurt. They do it because they want to feel the pain of the physical pain rather than the mental pain. So it is often that a person who's in extreme mental pain will harm themselves. That's why we have cutters. People cut themselves because it, they, they, want it, they want the physical pain because that, it's a distraction. So when a person is losing it, they will do all kinds of, they will smash their heads into things. So when somebody says, oh, they had, they had the head trauma, maybe they smash their head into a damn wall, maybe into the car over and over again because they're so freaked out. They don't, not just doing that. 
he supposedly had some damage to the groin area. Um, I, and I can't figure out, there's a whole bunch of stories on that. One is that it's a bruising. Uh, other is stab, stab wounds. Again, you're angry. That guy stop messing with all the women. I don't know. Um, so because I can't see the autopsy, I can't see the depth of the wounds. I can't see where they are. Now, somebody came along and wrote this thing about how, oh, not only were there wounds to the chest and, and the neck, but there were also wounds to his back where he couldn't have reached. And there were a massive amount of other wounds and there were slashes. All, the, the original thing he said, well, and now this other guy comes along and says, oh, there's slashes all over his hands. See, this is a problem. You can't tell where the truth is because we don't have the actual um, Now, one of the, the, there was, uh, supposedly he died. The big thing was that he hit the carotid artery at one point or somebody else hit the carotid artery. Mind you, this is his own pen knife. A pen knife is not exactly what killers usually use. I mean, it's like, hey, give, give, give me a little knife, dude. You know, no. I mean, they usually have their own knives or a gun, something else. They don't usually stab you to death with your own pen knife. It's a little weird. Um, but carrying an own pen knife, that might be what you use on yourself. My question was, uh, I wanted to know what side of his, uh, where the carotid artery was that supposedly was stabbed for the major part of the loss of blood. Um, the claim, uh, one thing I read said it was the left side, which made me say, to my, say well, was he left-handed? So I looked. So you look up things and I go, oh, look, you know, he's holding stuff in his left hand here. He must be left-handed. But then he's holding a glass over here in his right hand. So maybe he's right-handed. Then again, maybe the, who knows that the pictures weren't flipped. I have no idea if he was right-handed or left-handed. Haven't got a clue. So <laughs> this is where we just go around in circles. Here's what I can tell you I know makes no sense. If somebody wanted to murder him, just plain out, they want to get rid of him. Baltimore, you guys in Baltimore. He's coming out of courthouse at night in Baltimore. There's stabbings in Baltimore all the time. There's shootings in Baltimore all the time. What a killer will do is do the simplest, easiest thing to get away with. They would have killed him right there on the street going to his car. They don't need to drive him for five hours all over Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and then stab him to death with his own pen knife in the middle of nowhere. What the heck? Why would you do that? Why would you chase him around with another car or jump in a car with him? What? And do all this. He would have been dead on the side, of, like one block from his, of his, from his office. That's how you do it. And there was no evidence that there, any of anybody was out to kill him. So the problem is when we, it looks like it's a homicide. It does. I get the point. It's like, why would, how would, how would he do this to himself? Why would he do this to himself? But then I don't know. Because he's got issues. Right before all this happens, he's got all these issues. His wife isn't even pushing to find out who killed him. I wonder if she doesn't know something. And did he have a problem with drug use? Did he have a problem with psych a, a psychotic you know, episode? Was he under so much pressure he finally just said screw it all and just ran away? And driving all over the place, losing his mind about things, thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, darn, 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 what do I do? And he maybe he nicked himself and he got the, I don't know. But I'll tell you what I do know. It's not the way people kill people. I would be surprised, actually surprised that this was a homicide. It would be a very weird homicide. Something I, I, I don't, you just don't see, that this is not the way things go down. I can't imagine who... Who would have lured him out or out of that office building to jump in his car and drive around for how many hours was that? He left at 1138. And he was out there at least four hours on the road. And he was found at five o'clock in, in a godforsaken little spot. No other sign of another vehicle. How the heck did the killer even go anyplace? And if they're, track, if they're tracking him from station uh, from, from tow booth to tow booth, there's got to be people coming in behind him who will be right behind him the entire time if there were a second car. None of that is proven. So, and if somebody were in the car with him, how did, where did he go after he stabbed him in this place? And yet there supposedly actually is no DNA of another person or a second car. So in my opinion, if I, unless I, if I could see the autopsy, I would be curious to find out whether 36 of those stab wounds were very, very minor and were more 
more what they call um, hesitation things. Just somebody who's in a, in, a, in a frenzy. They do little things to themselves. They just lo- they're kind of losing it. They just don't know what to do. They don't want to. I would be curious if that's what the truth was. And finally, he hit something that was serious enough, or, or crashed the vehicle. Just losing his mind, crashed the vehicle in this little river because it looked like a vehicle crash. I mean, it wasn't like he was pulled off the side of the road having an affair with somebody doing some kind of sex thing, and then he got killed. I mean, it looks like the car, it was still, the car the engine was still running everything. It looked like the car had gone off the road and just ended up in that position. At that point, had he stabbed himself, he was losing consciousness and he slammed into it and then he staggered out of the car trying to get help and then just passed out in the creek. That's what it looks like to me. So I don't see the second person. I don't see the second person in his office. I don't see the second person in his car. I don't see the second person following him. Uh, so without the autopsy and toxicology reports, I do not know. But I'm suspicious that most of those wounds were very superficial and that he might have been having a psychotic break or beyond some kind of drugs agitated him. And he chose to drive away in a frenzy and didn't know just driving around because it didn't appear that he was going any place that made any sense. So I can't say it's a homicide. I can't say it's a suicide, but I can't say it's a homicide either. So um, let me go check some of your comments. But this is what happens when you have so little information uh, and we just start jumping to conclusions here and there and everywhere. So um, let me see what we have to say down here. Um, uh, <laughs> my husband is saying it's a ghost and he now just lost his watching Pat Brown privileges. <laughs> a ghost. Well, you know, you never know. Um, oh, the $200. Um this is another thing we don't know. Okay. He got $200 out of an ATM, but supposedly in his vehicle, there was money for like, like thrown around like tens and fives and ones. Now somebody pointed out and I, I have, I have to go up to my own ATM to look at that. I always get twenties. I'm a twenties person. I know that fifties are paying the ass. I always get twenties. Um, that's if I use cash at all. Um, I rarely use cash, but if I do, it's twenties. Um, I rarely have anything that's small. Uh, he did he go there and get I don't know different ATMs give you a whole bunch of mixed money. Do they do that as a server purpose? Um, I mean, sometimes I wish I had it. Like let's say I'm let's say I'm going to uh, stay at a, a, a kind of nice hotel, and then I'm supposed to like tip the doorman, and I'm supposed to tip the guy who takes my luggage to my room, and I got and I gotta have cash for that crap. If I if I valet a car, and I'm like, oh crap, I need cash, yeah. you know. So then I have to go find a way to get cash, and I. Tr- you know, try to get $20 and buy $1 thing someplace. I get $19 and change. <laughs> it's a pain, but you know, but I don't know what he got out of the ATM. The police would know that, but the money was in the car. So it wasn't, it wasn't robbed. So I can tell you that. Um, that's a, that's a, okay. Here's an interesting point. GMFR. Good point. You wouldn't want to stab the driver of the car. Um, you know, if, if you're in the second seat, yeah, you would really wouldn't want that. Um, some people point out that it was, there was a blood pool in the back of the car and the passenger side. So their theory is that he was back there and somebody else was driving. And that's why that person used toll booth and didn't, you didn't realize that he had the, um, uh, the easy pass. Now let's look at this. Uh, let's go, let's go back to that picture um, of the, let's go back here. Uh, he, he used an easy pass up to here. Now, is it possible he picked up somebody around this area and that person got in the car with him and stabbed him at some point, stabbed him and put him in the back seat, and then he drove the car and they didn't realize about the ticket thing. So he got tickets because he didn't realize he had an easy pass. Is that possible? Yes. Is it possible that the blood on the ticket was was uh, um, Luna's blood, but not because Luna touched the ticket, but because the guy who stabbed Luna touched the ticket. In theory, that would be true. However, there is blood in the driver's seat of the car. And then there's a pool of blood uh, and the passenger on the floor of the passenger side. Supposedly, that is blood that went down through the seat and um, drained down there. Again, don't have any of the reports. So I'm hearing these from different places. And they're saying that's what it came. It came through the seats. It wasn't that he was in the back and stabbed because um, there was no blood on the back seat. You know, supposedly no blood 
like on the seat. Like if you were moving around in the back and moving his hands and body, there will be blood on the back window, on the back seat, you know, on the, you know, what, I suppose it looked like it drained. So if that's true, then he was still in the passenger seat. But the thought being that could it be that some, he met somebody here with that missing time. Somebody got in there, stabbed him, put him in the back, uh, drove the thing and got off the right about here and, and then sort of wrecked the car and then got Luna out and stabbed him some more and then chucked him in a stream and ran off. I guess. I guess. Uh, that's possible. But who the heck was it? <laughs> why was he? Why would he leave the office at that time of night and drive that far to pick up somebody in the middle of nowhere, um, and then get stabbed with his own pocket knife? But is it possible? Sure. But that would put the person in his car, and that would take away the the uh, um, the two uh, two tanks of gas thing. That makes no sense. Um, very very confusing. Um, well, let me get my glasses back on because I do need to see those for this. Oh, interesting. Okay. It says in PA at the time you could get $10 in some, but nothing smaller. Interesting. All right. Did he get cash to use at the toll? Okay. Let me think about that. Uh, okay. Let me look at that. That's a, that's a good question. Um, okay. He used his easy pass on I-95. Okay, he used, his, he used the easy pass into Delaware, and then he went and got the $200 out of his bank account at that point. And then he used his debit card to buy gas. And then he used the, then he used, he got the toll ticket. So you might be right. He might have gotten that to get the tolls to pay for tolls uh, on a ticket. The question is why? Why would that even make any sense? Because unless I say, uh, I, and I don't have a good answer for it. I mean, this is one of these things you'd have to spend, you know, get get the real reports, get everything you can get a hold of and spend hundreds of hours uh, trying to figure out. Um, because I have an easy pass and it's, it's, it's right on the window. It's like pretty obvious it's an easy pass. But if he did, Let, let's go through the concept of, okay, so he uses the easy pass. He gets his $200. If he goes and gets his own $200 out of his own ATM, then he knows what he's getting the $200 for, which means if he's planning to get toll tickets as opposed to using easy pass, he's the one doing it, not some stranger that he picked up who, see, the, he's already got the $200. He's already made that choice. Um, but yeah. It seems like he did not want, it seemed to me like he did not want the information about where he was going at that point on his easy pass information. Cause that comes in, you know, you, it comes in on your, you know, your paperwork. It comes in and says, you went here, you went here, you went here. Where was he going? They didn't want somebody to know about. And who's the somebody who would know about it? The only thing I, person I can think of is his wife. She's the only person that wouldn't know about it. So, um, and again, was it $200 also that much? Was it, you know, he could have just gotten 40 bucks out if he was just going to pay for some uh, tolls. Um, he paid, but the, he also paid for the gas. Let's see. When did he pay for the gas? Hold on a second. Okay. So he paid for the gas with his debit card when he was still on the Pennsylvania turnpike. And then when he exited the turnpike, that's when he used. And none of it makes sense. I, mean, I swear to God, it's like, it's a crazy thing because it's, 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 it's really bizarre uh, that none of it makes a whole lot of sense. Um, uh, it was reported he had been in the area where he was found several times in the preceding months. Okay. Reported. There we go. I, I don't know what that means. <laughs> um, I don't because there's so many, there's so many stories about this guy, uh, all kinds of just weird stuff. Uh, I don't, I don't know any of the validity of it. This is why I try to tell people, could I, and could I do a good job?
coming to conclusions on a certain case? And the answer would be yes, if I knew anything. Well, how the heck do I know anything when everything is reported here, reported there, this conflicts with that? I don't know. And I think we, this is what we have to be very aware of when we're and trying to interpret anything from the outside. We don't know. And I've always said, you know, if I could get hold of the police report, I might look at that and go, oh, now I know what happened. All these 20 years, I've wondered what happened. And all I have to do is look at the autopsy report, the toxicology report, and the police report, and I know exactly what happened. Why nothing has come of it? Why no absolute statements haven't been made? I don't know. Honest to God, I don't know. But I can't tell from the outside when I hear this and that. Um, uh, Nina says, it sounds like he withdrew 200 to purchase a stimulant to help him finish the assignment. Well, the $200 was made out of state. Why the heck would he go out of state to buy some cocaine? Believe me, you get cocaine in, in Baltimore. <laughs> you know what I mean? His work is in Baltimore. It's not way up here. Uh, that's a long, long darn way to go. Oh, yeah, cold night. And it's a very bizarre, um, not a, usually people go to do a specific thing. They go do a specific thing. They don't wander around for five hours going in different directions. I mean, he's look at the, see, see the, there's, there's better ways to get places. Oh, as a matter of fact, they said you could probably go from here to here in two hours and save all this extra stuff, but he didn't. Um, and yeah, it's very confusing. Um, uh, was there no surveillance at the toll booth? Uh, um, I'm not absolutely sure. All I know is they have no evidence of him being any place. Everything is grainy. <laughs> um, it's also 20 years ago. Worse. Still, it's still pretty crappy. But uh, a lot of times they don't take, I don't know that they take, take video of the people in the cars. Um, and it's night, so probably grainy crap. Um, but no, not supposedly nothing has been proven that there was a second person. Um, uh, Linda says his behavior is odd because he's not in his right mind. Well, we don't know with or without of drugs. He was on a mission of destruction. And I think that's not a bad concept that not, we don't know what's going on, but what does he's going on is abnormal. Okay. It's so abnormal. And it is, in my opinion, unless he was literally forced out of the office with a gun to his head, all, it all started there because he didn't, he went there to do work that he never did. He left without his phone and his glasses. Something happened to him that made him leave, but I don't see this forced out with a gun. So gets in his own car, drives his own a certain way. He goes into stores. Some of them say he looked perfectly calm. He came in and looked calm. They didn't say anybody was with him. So, yeah, it looks like a very strange, um, uh, just because AP reports anything doesn't mean it has any meaning. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, don't you need to enter your passcode? You do. Uh, you do, but it doesn't mean somebody can't ask you what your passcode is. You know, your passcode, you can put a gun to somebody's head and say, what's your passcode? You better give them it, you know, and then somebody else could have gotten it out. Um, I can't again say whether the video proved it was him standing at the machine. He's a, he's a kind of a unique looking fellow. He's kind of, kind of small and young looking. He looks young for his age. Um, but I don't know that they could see that it was him. They could see it's a person. So again, the, the information is very, 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 very poor. Um, well, his phone was left, his phone was left in the, uh, his phone was left in the office, but, what what I'm sure they were able to access the phone after he died to see text messages and calls, but that's in the police report, which we do not have access to. There has been nothing that's come out about this case in, in all of these years. Nothing. And so that's why some people think it's a whole big, uh, you know, he was murdered and uh, the FBI knows who did it and da, 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 da. Or he was, there was some, uh, there was issues about another fellow. Um, let's see if I can find his name. Um uh, yeah, Slain, this one comes out of the Baltimore Sun. Slain prosecutors' relationship with women are examined. Okay, no, this is not, that's not what I was looking for. Uh, they said he had fallen out of favor with his uh, had work problems. They said he had a personal relationship with other women. Uh, said that um, they were view reviewing adult pornographic files found on Luna's Justice Department computer that appeared unrelated to his caseload. 
which his caseload had included prosecution of online child pornography and predators, but they thought this did not have anything to do with that. Um, authorities were compiling extensive information about Luna's personal life and his final hours. They continued searching for a suspect in his killing. Here they're saying it's his killing. Um, and now these are different investigators. See, there's, there's two groups of investigators. One say it's a homicide one say it's a, um, uh, one say it's suicide. And I can't tell you which one it is because I said here, Luna had expressed no concerns over his job security, but uh, he joined the federal prosecutor's office four years ago. He was stylish and energetic and showed promise as a young lawyer. Um, he handled a range of cases, but most notable was the prosecution of a Navy physicist who was accused of trying to seduce a teenage girl. This is where the big problem came in. Luna won convictions in a string of violent Baltimore County bank robberies and a curious trial that produced its own mystery. At the end of the trial, authorities discovered more than $36,000 of cash disappeared somewhere between the courtroom and the government storage area. Uh, that loss was never solved. And they thought that suddenly he had money that he shouldn't have. In recent months, lawyers who work with Luna said he appeared to be distracted and disorganized. Um, and then, uh, so late Wednesday, Luna told the defense attorney in the case he was, he was returning home from home to a federal to the federal courthouse to complete paperwork for expected plea deals. But then he left 11:30 at night. Instead of doing that, he left and ended up dead. So yeah, they were looking for activity on his credit cards and bank cards, um, looking for other trips in the area that to the area of where his body was found. Uh, they found someone with his name on internet dating sites. The author of the messages described himself as a discreet 31-year-old married black man seeking a white female sexual partner and indicated a preference for blondes and redheads, which seems odd to me that you put your real name on there if that was actually you. But they were examining relationships he had with at least two women. Uh, they questioned hotel operators near the crime scene for any unusual activity. Remember, I said the $200 might be used for... Um, for a hotel room or something he didn't want on his credit card. Um, agents made similar stops at gas stations uh, to see if there was other information on those. But that was back in, when was that? Uh, that was 2003. <laughs> it's 2023. Nothing. I was looking for the uh, the one you asked, uh, the one about the uh, his relationships with, he had a relationship with a guy who had, not considered too great a fellow. Let's see. Um, who was the guy? Uh, it was actually a, uh, um, there was another fellow who was in trouble up there and there was issues over that. Um, this says Luna's wife has not talked publicly about the case since his death. She did not respond to numerous phone calls or a letter requesting an interview. So I say it's a very, very obviously mysterious case. Um, Mark Safarik, uh, the retired FBI pro profiler, he says uh, the case for murder in, Luna, in Luna's death is weak. He said, you would have used a weapon that would have taken care of business quickly. A Swiss army style knife found at the scene killed Luna. A pen knife or a Swiss army knife is not the type of weapon you use in a homicide. But he, he did not go for the homicide theory. And that's a Safric. Um, we're certain there was no evidence to show he was with anybody after he left the courthouse. That's the FBI saying that. Um, so unless he picked up somebody along the way, and all, everything went to hell from there on out, perhaps. But who was he picking up somewhere around here? And where was he going with that person? I mean, there, would he drive that far to have a relationship in the middle of the night when he had stuff to do? Um, and, and then that person turned on him and stabbed him over and over again with his own knife? I don't know. See, it's, it's, a, it's a very weird thing. Um, The news said authorities said he was in Lancaster, Lancaster County several times in the month before his death, and it wasn't work-related. 
interesting. Again, people say and people say and people say, and I have no clue about the truth on any of this stuff. And that's my whole point for the show is that both of these cases, we have very little solid information from police, nothing from police reports, nothing from autopsy, nothing from toxicology, nothing from anything except so-and-so said and so-and-so said. I take all of that with a grain of salt because I know that it's not necessarily so. So yeah, he was a good looking young kid. He was not that young, but he's, he was a very young looking guy. I mean, this is a guy that would, Luna was a guy who could be 60 years old and look, still look 30. Yeah. Yeah. yeah unbelievable. Um, whatever happened. Uh, but could someone have defended themselves against him? Not with his own knife. I mean, And he was, oh, by the way, I, forget, I don't think I mentioned this. He was completely dressed, mind you. He was in his suit still. He was totally in his suit with his, he still had a thing hanging around his neck with his name tag on it. He wasn't undressed. So again, this is, this is not, it doesn't look like that kind of thing. No, he wasn't half undressed. I mean, all his clothes were on, <laughs> you know. I don't know, it's very, very strange. Um, but that's where we're going to end up staying. Uh, you know, some, some cases uh, are just the way they are, you know, and you can't go further with, you can do all the, you can do all the YouTube shows you want, all the podcasts, and you end up with nothing because we don't have enough information to be sure we know what's going on. All I can say again, for both of these cases, and so that'll be my final statements on this, um, on both of these cases, what we have is we have two people who are very successful in life who should have gone on for many more years having good lives. Uh, they were both seemingly in committed relationships, um, people who cared about them. They both seemed to have a reasonable amount of money or a way to make good money in the future. Um, but right before these incidents, something did something to the minds of both these guys for some reason, whether it was whether they were involved in something that shouldn't have been or whether their minds were something was happening to their mind due to dementia or drugs or whether they knew somebody was after them and they were paranoid for a good reason. As is said, sometimes you're paranoid because you should be paranoid, right? Um, something happened right before they took the final ride. <clears throat> and the thing that's most important is that if anybody wanted to kill either one of these guys, like, uh, a planned homicide, you know, where, where somebody was out to get him for some reason, somebody was out to get him for some reason. He wouldn't be, he wouldn't be destroying his own hard drive and driving off to this location. He wouldn't have been leaving his office at that time of night and driving all over Timbuktu. He would have just, I say, he would have just been shot somewhere on the street somewhere and he would have been killed definitely in Baltimore. Nobody would have had a clue who did it to him <laughs> because there's, there's a murder a day in Baltimore. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a hell hole as far as uh, safety goes up there. I mean, we needed people like him fighting for justice up there. Um, I mean, his, this place was kind of calm, but this place is not calm. It's Baltimore. And if he got killed in a street robbery, you know, no one would have thought a thing of it. They would have said, Oh my God, you know, he got, he went, was going to his car. He got stabbed in the parking lot. That's what you do. You don't drive the guy all over two, three states <laughs> and, just make, and kill him with his own little pen knife. I mean, that's not a that's not a premeditated homicide by an assassin. These are not these guys were not assassinated. Only thing I could say is he did whatever happened to uh, Greek car. He did to himself. He either killed himself or he ran away. He. One of two things happened. He either went into some psychotic state, freaking out over the, the money issues. Uh, possibly he was going for a polygraph that maybe did prove that he took the $36,000. Maybe it's just he was over his head with everything. Maybe whatever. Maybe he was doing drugs and lost his, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's just crashed and burned that day. He's just driving all over the place going, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. And he killed himself. Not may, may, I don't know if he, even on purpose, but just in a some kind of psychotic state or he went to meet somebody somewhere for some reason, way out, way far away, 
and didn't want to be tracked. So he left his phone. He rushed out to meet somebody in, I don't know, Pennsylvania. And something went wrong and the person killed him. <laughs> but he wasn't undressed. So they never got to the part where the fun would start, you know, if that's what it was for. I have no idea. So the police would look through his phone to see if he had any phone calls that came in right before he left. You would think if he's meeting somebody, he'd want to have the phone with him, but he didn't. I have no idea. So either he went into some psychotic state and into some frenzy, and just killed himself, or somewhere along the way, he picked somebody up who did something to him. But I don't know what the police know that I don't know. But Neither guys, neither of these guys were assassinated from by some big drug dealing groups or anybody with any kind of no professionalism was here. Let's put it that way. No, <laughs> as I, he did it to himself, first of all. But and this was no professional guy. So if he ended up dead uh, by somebody else's hand, it was some whack job who killed him. So that's my final thoughts on that. I'll check with you guys and then I'll sign off for tonight. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> hey, Baltimore's got a great. You know, Baltimore is such a sad thing. Baltimore's got so many cool areas of the city. And it's so it's very different from Washington, D.C., which is the other city that's on either side of me. You know, I got Baltimore on one side, D.C. on the other. D.C. is uh, fancier these days and it's still governmental, but it's, uh, it's all the up and coming yuppiness. But, uh, but Baltimore is still a northern city. Uh, D.C. is a southern city, but Baltimore is like a northern city and it still has all these little quaint areas, um, which I really like. And I just wish I felt safe up there, but I don't. And, you know, I'll go up there on rare occasions. Uh, and then last time I went with my daughter and she had her, her you know, she's, she, uh, was my, she's my bodyguard because <laughs> she is legally allowed to carry a weapon. So she had that on the front seat of the car saying, hey, you know, we're, we're in Baltimore. So, you know, we got the car that's going to be targeted. So I'm going to be ready. And it's sad because people love Baltimore. They love their city and, the quaintness of it in different places. But yeah, it's it, the, the crime rate up there is at, uh, really bad, really bad. And they need to do something about it. But I'm afraid their new mayor is an idiot. That's my opinion. And I think it's just going to make things worse. However, they did get a new um, a new prosecutor and to get rid of the, the last one who was crooked. And he seems to be pretty good. So maybe maybe he'll, he'll make changes. That's all I can hope. <laughs> well, you're welcome. I don't know how much of this was an analysis more than it was to help people understand how how analyses work and what you can and cannot do under the circumstances. So um, Lauren says, live in Baltimore. <laughs> I'm sorry, Baltimore. <laughs> Thank you for your tonight's cases. I would also like to hear your take on Sean Souter. Sean Souter. I'm not sure who that is. Is that a Baltimore case? <laughs> but uh, yeah, Baltimore. I just hope everything, I want Baltimore to come back strong one day. I really do. Because I, I think it's a cool place. Except I'm scared to go there. <laughs> I stopped working there a long time ago. I'm like, mm, not going. <laughs> oh, you're welcome, Allison. This were these were the, I had these requests so often for these two. I thought I just put them together because I thought they had such similarities in in analysis issues that I thought they'd make a, a good pair. Um, so you can thank the people who asked me to do this over and over and over again <laughs> because um, and you guys, you know, you do. You have to be that squeaky wheel. Um, because eventually I will get to certain cases, but I have to, there's so many requests that I, you know, the one, certain ones start standing out and then I'm going to do them because, you know, they're becoming something that is, um, so I'm going to do who, what did that, what was that request? Let me see what my request was, um, uh, for, um, and, and I've been real bugged about this one. So now I'm going to do it. Okay. And one guy said, oh, Pat, Pat's from in the U.S. She doesn't do U.K. cases. I'm like, yes, I do. So I'm going to do Jody Jones, the murder of Jody Jones, um, because there's been a big thing that just happened. Uh, Luke Mitchell uh, is the one who was uh, convicted. Uh, and now they've done another documentary that says he, he didn't do it. Um, and so and the professor, David Wilson, who is like a profiler, he says that Luke Mitchell did not do it and that he fears Jody's killer will never be uh, caught and charged. So um, I'm going to do that case. It's a real hot, hot case. And I don't know what I think about it yet. So I haven't looked into it. I don't know if I think Luke Mitchell is guilty, but apparently the new documentary come, came out and somebody said, well, the documentary, it's, it's like a uh, West Memphis three. It's like Adnan Syed. And it's like um, um, 
uh, uh, making a murderer, Stephen Avery. I said, well, I think all three of them are guilty. All those three cases, I think they got the right people. So <laughs> if it's like that, then the guy's guilty. But I don't know. I don't know that he is. So I'm going to be looking at it. So, <laughs> well, there you go. If the documentary says so, it must be true. Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> so, oh, Sean Sood. Oh, he is a Baltimore. Oh, oh, interesting. It's a Baltimore homicide detective. Oh, okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Wait a minute. Before I before I do anything else, let me just throw his name in here so I don't forget to to look at it. Sean Suter. There it is. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it out because I like to do some close to home ones. So yeah, I will definitely do that. Oh, aren't you nice? Thank you, Nina. <laughs> Bitte. <laughs> Very little German that I know from my German grandmother. But um, oh, let's see. Uh, Suda was found dead with a shot to the head a day before he was scheduled to testify in front of a federal grand jury against corrupt police co connected to the gun trace task force. Oh, I do think I remember that. That is a little suspicious. Hmm, that, that might be suspicious indeed. Um, <laughs> I will check that out. Yeah, there's, I mean, you know, it's not like I don't think something squirrely could have happened here with Luna. It's the way it went down that makes me think it's not um, related to any casework he was doing. That's why. I mean, if I say if he'd been killed on the street, I would have gone. Maybe. But because of his the recent stuff going on in Luna's life and his bizarre behavior that night and his bizarre behavior driving all over three states, I've, that's that does not reek of professionalism. If he didn't commit su if he didn't stab himself because he was in some kind of weird frenzy, and committed suicide, if he didn't do that, then I think something else just freaky weird happened that he picked up somebody and did something with. But I don't believe for a minute that this was a professional hit on him. Uh, that just that, that just that doesn't compute to me. <laughs> so anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm going to look at the show. I'll look at the Sean Suda thing. I'll see what I can come up with on that one. So sometimes it just depends whether I can really analyze anything. It makes it worthwhile. So sometimes I just can't come up with anything. Uh, in these cases, it was hard to come up with anything because the, the information doesn't exist. It's it's actually two of the quietest cases I've ever, ever seen. It's like almost nothing there for either one of them. Except a few strange things in a few strange places, but not solid stuff where you say, here's, you know, here's all the information I can access all this stuff. So there again, this is an open case and maybe they do know something or maybe they believe he was murdered, but they can't figure out who the heck did it because of some some freaky person in some place. Or maybe they do say, you know, it doesn't look like he killed himself and we can't really put another person there. So what do we do with this case? And, and for this fellow, unless they find a body or he shows up, they don't know. All they know is he chucked his stuff into the Susquehanna River, but they don't know if he chucked himself in afterwards. <laughs> That's the real question. <laughs> so, so I'm glad you all were here. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'll see you for the hangout during the week and then for the UK case, which I will do. I will indeed. So see you next time. Mm -hmm.